This is a legislative conference for public sector pension plans, and obviously most of our activities in terms of legislation, politics, and policy are at the state level. So the next two presentations are going to be precisely about that. Um, first, we're going to talk about the recently enacted pension reform in Illinois. Um, it, has, uh, it was referenced by Mel Aronson in his opening address. And then um, after the Illinois presentation, we're going to have a conversation about the legal matters in the Detroit bankruptcy filing. So to take us through uh, what's going on in Illinois, the legal ramifications and more of the political ramifications of the Illinois pension reform legislation, joining us this morning is Steve Kreisberg, Director of Research and Collective Bargaining at the American Federation of State county and municipal employees. Um, this position serves, uh, Steve is the director, as I said, of the research and collective bargaining services at ASME. This position serves as the international union's focal point for collective bargaining, health and pension benefits, and the development of ASME's public policies on health care and retirement security. He has served in the, in the capacity of a full-time professional staff person in the labor movement since 1981. He has deep roots in the labor uh, movement as well as other public sector employee associations. Um, uh, Steve has a Bachelor of Science degree from Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Please help, us, please help me welcome Steve Kreisberg. Thanks, Hank. Uh, appreciate being here. Appreciate being with all of you and uh, at the NC PERS conference. Uh, you know, our, we've, uh, our union has a, a great relationship with NC PERS. We work together on the uh, National Public Pension Coalition, and uh, I think this is one of the more valuable uh, associations uh, that, that exist in terms of, as we move forward, protecting employee benefits, managing those benefits. And uh, these times are difficult, and it seems like uh, they're getting more difficult. Hank and I were talking, I don't know, it wasn't too long ago, it was last fall, and we were thinking that, you know, with the um, improved economy, the improved performance of, in the equity markets, that maybe we were going to turn a curve. Uh, but uh, it doesn't appear as if that's the case right now. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's tough. It's been tough. Uh, this coming year could be even tougher in some respects, uh, you know, Hank talked about Detroit. I'm going to talk about Illinois. Uh, but we can look at the state of Pennsylvania systems. We can look at the city of Chicago. Uh, you can look at places uh, where we'll be under attack, whether it be Florida or Oklahoma and, uh, and many others. So the fight is far from finished. And I think the political environment that we're in has not necessarily improved uh, in some respects. Um, you know, we may have lost some ground in some places. And I think um, some of that began uh, with uh, the 2011 uh, legislation in Rhode Island, where the treasurer there uh, put through legislation which for the first time, really, uh, in a major state system, uh, cut accrued benefits. And that's really what we're talking about, is reductions in accrued benefits. When you look at uh, places like Illinois, and you look at places like Rhode Island, and you look at places like Pennsylvania, the employer normal cost for our pension benefits is insignificant. We're talking about maybe 2% of pay. Uh, and that's just a generalization. It's that insignificant. So, and this is for the newer tiers, right? For the new, for the new employee tiers. So there's nothing left to cut. You can't reduce the benefit any further in, in terms of the employer cost. All of the money, essentially, is in the accruals. Accruals, which of course the employers failed to pay for over many, many years. Uh, no more so, perhaps, than in the state of Illinois. Is anybody from Illinois in the room? Well, congratulations. <laughs> okay, well, see, congratulations because you do have Article 13, Section 5, uh, which talks about pension and retirement rights. And uh, if you can't read it, I'll just read it for you very quickly. Membership in any pension or retirement system of the state, any unit of local government or school district, or any agency or instrumentality thereof, shall be an enforceable contractual relationship, the benefits of which shall not be diminished or impaired. Seems like that's fairly dispositive uh, and should end the story now and my presentation should be complete. Uh, but as we know, that's not the case. 
And I think Bob, in the, in the next uh, presentation, Bob Costner will talk a little bit about, because we have similar language in the Michigan Constitution, he'll talk about some of the, the legal aspects of this. Uh, but of course, a state can't petition for bankruptcy. States cannot enjoy the protections of Chapter 9 of the Bankruptcy Code. Uh, municipalities can uh, petition for bankruptcy with the approval of the state, but the state itself cannot do it. So the, the state of Illinois has uh, three major retirement systems. There's the teacher system, state employee system, and the state university system. And they are different uh, in terms of their benefits, uh, but they have a number of things in common, uh, including uh, fairly decent cost of living protections. They have cost of living escalators in, 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 in virtually, and I think in those three systems, of 3% compounded per year. Uh, so those often become the target in our discussions uh, when we talk about reducing accruals. And the COLA has become the target for um, the same reason that Willie Sutton robbed banks. It's where the money is. Uh, and, and it's believed that uh, you know, we can go and, and, and do something with the COLA. So we saw that in Rhode Island. Uh, you also saw some movement on retirement ages in Rhode Island. Uh, but that's, you know, if, if we're going to look at the, uh, the, the, uh, the beginning of this in Rhode Island in 2011, that's where a lot of those cuts to accruals were made. Uh, employees had, active employees had to suffer uh, longer, uh, long, older retirement ages, and uh, retirees as well as actives who move into retirement will have some suspension of their cost of living. Uh, so in Illinois, what we're talking about is really a political issue because, as I just said on the previous slide, you can't do it legally, right? So we change what the law means to us, right? So this language that is fear appears pretty plain and that there was a consensus understanding about uh, for the 40-some-odd years since it was adopted uh, now is going to mean something different than it meant for the last four decades. And as an interesting sidelight, uh, from what I understand, the Speaker of the House in Illinois, uh, Mr. Madigan, actually was at the Constitutional Convention when this was adopted. Uh, so I guess from his perspective, he can talk with authority about what it really meant. Um, but uh, put another way, it might have meant something in the 1970, I think it was 71 or 72 when it was adopted, than it does in 2013 when these pension changes uh, were adopted. So it's really, it's really about politics. It's not about law, and it's about how in, in the 21st century we're seeing a challenge to our basic legal underpinnings of our democracy, because the Constitution is a foundation document. It's a foundational document of our entire democracy, but now you know, it's being interpreted in a political way that's very different than what we've seen throughout our nation's history. Uh, without going too far off, I mean, I think that's a function of a consolidation of economic power. So when we have economic power consolidated, uh, the same people who've, who've obtained that economic power now want to consolidate political power. And so in that respect, we're seeing a, a squishier uh, interpretation of documents, like an Illinois state constitution, uh, and that's where we're headed. So it is political, and it's based on the fact that the state of Illinois has put itself in a, in a, in a pretty tough position. Uh, they, as people have said to me, they had never funded their pensions on an actuarial basis. Their pensions were funded on a political basis, meaning we'll fund it the way we want to fund it. Now you can compare the state funds, the three that I mentioned, with the Illinois Municipal Retirement Funds, IMRF, which is, as it implies, free municipalities. But the states in almost all circumstances, make the municipalities actually pay the normal cost and the annual required contribution each year. So the IMRF is 100% funded with a benefit levels that are substantially equivalent to what we see in the other three funds, which demonstrates there's nothing wrong with pensions. It's not the pension system that leads to these types of things. It's determinations and decisions made by politicians uh, to do other things with the money. And I think in Illinois, uh, the politicians have decided they would borrow money, if you will, from the pension funds. Not a direct borrowing, but you borrow money by simply not making the contributions. So you have a system that exists for decades, never appropriately funded. So we go into the 1970s with the Constitutional Convention, and uh, some smart guys were there, university professors, and said, hey, I'm a little bit worried about my pension. 
because it's not properly funded. And remember, this is the, in this era, you know, we, you know, this, this is a, this is leading up to the passage of ERISA, where there was a lot of concern about underfunded corporate pension plans. Uh, there was a lot of hardship when companies in the private sector went bankrupt and left their, you know, their former workers and retirees in a lurch. Uh, Studebaker is one of the more notorious cases. So as a result of that, we were leading up to passage of ERISA, and this is that era. This is, this is before ERISA, but it's leading up to that, so it's, it's, it, it's discussed. People are discussing the idea of you need pre-funding. So at the convention, the Constitution Convention, uh, that's discussed, and the convention uh, is looking at various possibilities for amendment. One of them would, would, of course, amend the Constitution in a way that would require funding. Uh, New York State pretty much has that, right? You've got to keep your, your pension funds on, 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 on good actuarial footing. Well, in Illinois, they tried it a little bit different. They said, basically, we're going to promise you a benefit. Don't worry about it. We're going to promise you that benefit. It's backed by the full faith and credit of the state of Illinois. What more could you ask? Uh, but we're not going to promise you funding. We'll promise you a benefit, but not funding. Uh, and that's where things stood, and that's where the language that uh, was on the previous slide came from. Uh, but of course, the funding was never properly addressed, and it deteriorated even further over the coming two decades. So in 1995, the legislature said, hey, we got to do something about this. So what they decided they would do is say, let's get to full funding, but let's not do it until we're dead. <laughs> so we, they, they adopted a 50-year amortization schedule. But hey, the state of Illinois, for better or worse, is going to be with us forever. So what's 50 years? So let's do it that way. And uh, the amortization then, of course, is set as a percent of payroll. And there's probably some actuaries in the room uh, or people who are, know enough about actuarial work who can tell us that when you do that, you're going to actually have negative amortization on a 50-year schedule for the first few years, right? So you're actually not paying enough because of your you know, your, your assumptions about percentage of payroll growth, you're actually not paying enough even to keep even. So you're going to have declining funding levels until it kind of comes up. So you create like a little bit of a J. Well, the J in Illinois, they like to call the J a ramp, the, the funding ramp. So uh, we get on the funding ramp in about 20 years, a little less. That's where we are today, right? Fast forward from 1995 to 2013. And if you look at the uh, projected payments from the state, they become fairly onerous. And it's on that basis that the state says, hey, I don't want to pay. It's inconvenient. It costs money. Imagine that. Pensions actually cost money. So that is the political situation they find themselves in over the last couple of years. You've got uh, current funding levels of less than 40% across the three funds. Uh, it might be better now because of uh, you know, good gains over the last 12 months in, in the markets. Uh, but give or take, we got $100 billion in unfunded obligations, $100 billion. Uh, and that's not Joshua Rao discount rates. That's the discount rates that is used by the funds, which are 7 and 3 quarters and 8%. So it's serious underfunding, $100 billion. Now it's less, of course, because uh, the pension legislation reduced the liabilities. And, you know, the way I look at liabilities, is liability is nothing more than a benefit that somebody's earned. So liability is a, a name and it sounds very negative. But as we know, I think most of us know in this room, well, a liability is, is an earned benefit. It's what somebody has already performed the service and the promise has been made, I will compensate you for that service. Uh, so the legislature finds itself within a, in a situation where they're just completely unwilling to tax. Uh, they create loophole after loophole. Uh, we have an environment across the country, but uh, very much so in the Midwest, among many states, Wisconsin and Indiana for two, which are neighboring states of Illinois. Uh, Kentucky has played the game as well, uh, where there's kind of this competition to get corporations to move to your state by saying, well, if you come here, you don't have to pay taxes, right? So we have corporate loopholes developing. Illinois also has a flat income tax, which is in, in effect regressive. Lower income people actually wind up paying a higher percentage of their income in income tax than higher income people. Uh, that's constitutional. Uh, so there's limitations that have been self-imposed in Illinois on the ability to cut revenues and address some of these issues. But despite those limitations on revenues, uh, you've got a legislature that has a, uh, 
an insatiable appetite for spending money uh, on, on all sorts of things. Uh, so there's, you know, it's fairly progressive in a lot of ways, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, but somewhere along the line, the pensions become the lowest priority. And, you know, our union has a history of, of progressive activism. Uh, and so, but we very much resent how our, uh, the expenses for pensions are portrayed. And it happened in Rhode Island as well, where we would have uh, Democrats who would call themselves progressives and pro-worker Democrats come to us and say, yeah, but these pension expenses are squeezing out social spending, and we can't have that. You know, we can't have your members benefiting at the expense of the poor people of, the, of our state. And we're saying, it doesn't have to be that way. Why don't you just tax the rich people, right? I mean, we can look at the revenue side here. It was looked at, though, is that revenues are fixed, that we can't address corporate loopholes and the tax expenditures through, through, through some, many of these loopholes that are inefficient, ineffective, don't create jobs, but give breaks to the wealthiest corporations in America or the wealthiest corporations in the world, since almost all of them are multinationals. Uh, and there just doesn't help the residents of the state in any way, but it does help the shareholders of the corporations. So we posit the question differently than is posited back to us, but even some of our, what we would like to have considered our friends. Uh, the state of Illinois also, frankly, has solvency issues. We, uh, our state workers ha are in a self-insured health fund. Many providers in that fund have to wait nine months or more to be paid. So you go to the doctor as an employee, you pay your $10 copay. Doctor's waiting almost a year to get reimbursed by the fund. It got so bad that the legislature is now paying interest to its vendors on its late payments, and the interest rates are great. So it's 7 or 8% for a vendor, and they're saying, hey, that's fine. If you could afford it on a cash flow basis, this is the best investment in town, right? But the state, of course, is putting itself further and further behind. It's like somebody living on their credit card and not paying their credit card bills, so they're getting interest and penalties. And as we all know, most credit card interest is not the, the most competitive rate. Uh, the Constitution and the state statutes require that bondholders have the first claim on revenue. So they're paid first. And Rhode Island did the same thing. The bondholders would have the first claims on revenue. Um, how that would actually shake out for a municipality in a bankruptcy is something I'd leave for Bob to discuss. And of course, I don't want to leave this out, the state is run by our good friends because, as you know, we, we tend to support Democrats because we think Republicans are anti-worker. Uh, I think Democrats in Illinois are anti-worker uh, because that's what they've done, is they've taken workers' wages, uh, uh, Illinois is not a state that uh, has historically paid its workers particularly well. There's a huge variation, of course, of, on teacher pay based on school districts, uh, which is always the case. Uh, and university employees do also do not get uh, particularly well paid uh, at the worker level. And there's a variation, of course, again, with professors. Uh, but I think we're talking about people, by and large, who make $50,000 a year or less for earned retirement, uh, and now in many cases, it's being taken out from under them in terms of cost of living uh, increases. So let's just very briefly, uh, uh, and then I'll leave some time if people have a couple of questions, uh, just go through what, what SB1 did, which is what the uh, pension change uh, is called. It's effective uh, this coming July. It does reduce COLAs. It freezes COLAs. It puts in a pensionable salary cap, so you can't get pension on income above a certain level. Uh, there's, uh, it, it increases retirement age, and uh, there's some funding mechanisms in here, which uh, is kind of the trade-off, supposedly, for the workers and, and, and the retirees. So what's the COLA reduction? Well, effective next year, with the, when the COLA is due in January, uh, there's the current 3% compounded COLA is reduced based on a formula. And the formula takes into account years of service as well as the size of your pension. So there's a certain, your certain base of your pension that would be subject to COLA. So for, if you're not in Social Security and you work 20 years, the first $20,000 of your pension would be subject to COLA, and the rest would not. That's the, how that formula works. If you're not in Social Security, that, that, that formula is based on $800 times years of service. And then the 1,000 or the 800 is actually indexed each year for, for, based on the, the CPI. So your COLA now would only be applied on some of your pension for most workers, and most retirees, I should say. The freeze, they're essentially skipping COLAs uh, based on um, 
uh, on your age your act, as an active employee. You, you would uh, have either one, uh, three, four, or five colas that would be skipped. And uh, this information, uh, if it's not in handouts, you can get it right on the, uh, the websites of the retirement systems in Illinois. Pensionable salary cap for this year, it's 110,631. It's adjusted by the lesser of the CPI, uh, half a CPI or 3%. But the important thing to know that in, in most, in there's three different systems, so it's hard to, I didn't put them all up there. But for the state employees system, we assume individual salary increases of 4 to 6% a year, depending upon age. So what we're saying is we're guaranteeing that more and more people are going to hit the cap over time. Right now, I don't think there's more than a dozen AFSCME members who would be at this cap. Uh, as AFSCME members, there's probably, you know, there's, a, there's managers who would be. But 20 years from now, very much more, right? Because you're going to see salary growth, we hope, that exceeds, uh, you know, half of the CPI. And traditionally it has. Uh, so the huge impact will be felt in the future. The retirement age increase, uh, it affects employees who are right now 45 years old or younger. Uh, and there's a formula uh, for each year the members under 46, the age will increase by four months, up to five year increase of, in the normal retirement age. So let's talk a little bit about funding. So the last time our friends addressed, uh, addressed this in 1995, they said let's get to 90% funding in 50 years. Uh, now they're talking about getting to 100% funding in 30 years. So that's a little bit more routine, right? Many of us amortize our unfunded uh, liabilities and our pension plans over a 30 year period. So that, that's kind of mainstream. They've, they've joined the mainstream with that. Uh, it also authorizes the retirement systems to enforce this funding obligation, which is interesting to see how that would work. Uh, you know, we, we've had cases uh, in Illinois, and I think there was one in New Jersey, I think in both cases, I think it was the teachers unions that had filed lawsuits saying, hey, you're not funding our pensions. And the courts have said, yeah, they're not, but you're entitled to a benefit, you're not entitled to a funding status. And it gets into issues related to separation of powers. Can the judiciary order the appropriation of funding from a legislature when the constitutions of your state specifically give that responsibility to your legislatures? Interesting question. But now we're creating a contractual right to funding. We believe that it's simply a matter of enforcing a contractual right. But we also had a contractual right to our pensions, written right into the Constitution. And we've seen where that's gotten us. So the enforceability of this is questionable. That's a long way of saying that. Uh, and uh, we have no reason to trust the state of Illinois legislature. They've demonstrated they're not trustworthy. They've demonstrated a willingness to violate their oath of office, which is to uphold the state's Constitution. So uh, they have no credibility. They have no credibility with our union. Uh, that, that's the best way I can put it. Uh, the systems themselves are basically political. You've got five member trustees, five trustees appointed by the governor. So it's going to be up to the state comptroller, which is statewide elected office, if we're going to enforce this funding guarantee. Uh, here's the good news for employees. They may have lost a lot, but uh, they get to contribute 1% less of their pay towards their pension. And this, again, is based on this idea uh, and, and the legislature's apparent misunderstanding of the idea uh, that if you make cuts, you can do so if there's offsetting advantages. Uh, but clearly the 1% does not offset the reductions that employees are suffering. So two other changes, CB and DC, meaning collective bargaining and defined contributions. So collective bargaining has been suspended or eliminated for pensions. Uh, in the state, uh, and it does set up an optional defined contribution plan where employees can opt into a DC plan, but it's limited, it's capped to 5% of members of the system. Uh, the idea is that we don't want too much leakage out of the defined benefit program. Uh, whether that would really be the case is debatable anyway, where we've had these choices in other states, uh, the vast majority of employees choose the defined benefit pension. Uh, the legal arguments that are just made by legislators, and I'm not going to really go into them in great depth, is that the state believes they can do this through the, the plenary police powers of the state to protect health and welfare. 
Uh, so in other words, the, the, the case would be made, I suppose, that if we don't do these pension cuts, we won't be able to protect people and property within the state, and the general welfare will suffer. Uh, very much debatable. It gets into how the state is spending their money. I do not believe today, as we sit here, the state of Illinois is spending all of its money protecting people and property and health. They're spending money on all sorts of things, including um, inadvisable economic development subsidies. And the other I covered already, the uh, members are now provided with uh, reduced contributions and this guarantee of funding, which is supposed to be worth something. And that has value. Well, it does have value. We thought we already had it in the Constitution, though. So now we have a statute that's supposed to give us something that's more than what we had in the Constitution. Kind of an odd reasoning, in my view. Uh, but that's, uh, that's the state of Illinois. So I've um, got a couple of minutes if anybody has a comment or a question. Yeah, sir. Were the matching uh, funds from the state paid uh, each year into the fund, or were they paid the contributions? Yeah, for those who didn't hear, the question was, uh, did the state contribute what it should have been contributing over the years? And the answer is firmly no. Uh, the annual required contribution in the actuarial sense, you know, if you develop that under the GASB rule, the previous GASB rule, where um, uh, they, they never met that. And if they did, it was by accident. Uh, it, was, it was just not in their mindset. Then they developed, like I said, the 50-year ramp, which led to negative amortization and worst funding. And of course, what happened in 2008, 2009 uh, didn't help anybody. Uh, least of all, poorly funded uh, systems. Yeah. So, Did you have a follow-up on that? Uh, yes. So there was not a contribution defined by law like 10%? That's correct. The contribution was defined by the 1995 law that had the 50-year ramp. Right. This is kind of a... I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is usually a, a question, a softball question, but isn't it, does the legislature have a pension? If, and if it does, is it covered by these new rules? Yes and yes. The legislature does have a pension. Uh, it's a smaller pension fund, and they, they did not exempt themselves. They did exempt, I, I believe they exempted the judges, though. They don't want to get the judges pissed off at them. So, uh, but, uh, and the judges in Illinois, and this is an important feature, the judges are elected. The Supreme Court judges in Illinois are elected. And the speaker is known to have some political influence. And I, I guess, you know, there's seven judges, I think, and as, you know, Somebody might put it, he only needs four people to agree with him. That is constitutional. Right over there. So is the, uh, the DC plan, is that, um, and it, do, do members opt out of the DB plan into the DC plan? Yeah, and they would have, they, their accruals would be frozen. Right. And, but if something like that's put in place, so I guess the expectation is that a lot of members would actually opt out since, it, since there's a cap at 5% or? Yeah, I think that they, they did cap it at 5 uh, You know, this was something that the Republicans involved in the effort were promoting. They felt that there should be a DC. Uh, and so I think politically, uh, the, uh, the leadership needed to put together a coalition, right, to pass the bill. So the, this was kind of put out there, but they had to cap it because if you really were going to get a kind of a run on the bank, if you will, people pulling out of the DB, it would have created huge cash flow issues, uh, which would have affected rates of return and would have impeded their ability to get to full funding. So I think that's why the cap was put in there. Uh, our view is I'm not, we're not sure they needed the cap, although in Illinois, maybe so. Since Has the legal challenge already been filed? And if so, and even if not, what are the theories under which you're going to litigate? The legal challenges have been filed. I think there's four or five cases pending. Uh, we're about to file another. Uh, so various retiree associations have filed them, uh, as, and we're filing one for actives. Uh, and. You know, I'll leave it to others to talk about it. I think those arguments are still being developed. But I think ultimately, our point of view is simple, right? The Constitution guarantees this payment. It says it will not be impaired or diminished. It's been impaired and diminished, right? If there's a difference between impairing and diminishing, I don't know what it is, but it's it, it, uh, clearly violating the Constitution. So my view would be the plaintiffs, in this case, the, the workers and retirees, make the prima facie case. And it's up to the state to say, yeah, but. I have to do this to protect the health and welfare of the citizens of the state, and I'm giving them offsetting value. I think that's kind of how I see this shaping up, uh, but I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not involved in those cases, and uh, we'll leave it to uh, the Attorney General, who is the daughter of the Speaker of the House, to figure out how to make those arguments. Last question from uh, Jim McNamee. Sure. Um, I, 
I've had the uh, unique uh, um, uh, place of having sued our state over the funding. And <coughs> the situation was when we went in front of the Supreme Court, and at the time, the head of the, our Supreme Court was uh, Michael Blandick, who was a former mayor of Chicago. And I'll never forget what he told me when we lost the case was that, uh, one, he told me we had to trust the cities, and two, <coughs> come back when people aren't being paid. And I, of course, our position was the horse is out of the barn. So we had abdicated for years to copy because Illinois does have one good retirement system that is well funded. And the reason why it's well funded is the politicians cannot mess with the system. They have to pay in what they're supposed to pay in, which is Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund, which is about 92% funded. So we have a system that works in our state when you take discretion out of funding. And that is what we worked towards for all the downstate police and fire. And of course, Chicago ended up into that. Now they can't have discretion and funding. It's interesting in, in that in Illinois now, the big thing they want to negotiate with us is to get back to having discretion and funding, which is where we always end up in trouble. Because if the politicians have the right to have discretion and funding, they won't fund it. The philosophy in Illinois is, as everybody knows, Pension money is non-working money for them, and that's the reason why they don't use it. They can't do any patronage with it. They can't do any special projects with it. It's money they don't control, and that's why they don't have it. It's more of a pay-as-you-go system, and that's the way it's always looked in our state. And so we'll see what happens, but we do know if discretion is taken out of the funding, it works, because IMRF has always been well-funded. It's a large fund, and it's interesting. It's the fund that the mayors belong to. So, hey, they looked after their own. I just wanted to throw that in there. No, I think it's an important point. I mean, we see the same thing in New York State, where the New York State Fund, which is a statewide fund of municipalities as well as the state employees, is uh, always well-funded, traditionally has been well-funded. Uh, we see it in Wisconsin uh, and a few other states where it's based on actuarial requirements, and you fund it. It's just something that's required. Uh, you know, Chicago's the other shoe it, that's going to drop. Uh, the President of the Senate has already said that uh, his first priority is to do to city employees what they've done to state employees. Uh, in Illinois, the, uh, the state has authority to adopt any changes vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Chicago City Fund. So uh, that's, uh, that's the fight ahead. And uh, the funds are, are not well funded. Uh, you know, Chicago is coming off a situation where uh, Bernie Madoff was mayor. Actually, it was, I think the guy's name was Daly. Uh, but it was the same. But it was the same kind of system. I mean, he ran the city like he was Bernie Madoff uh, as a Ponzi. It was just crazy. The guy was selling off stuff to meet operating expenses, and um, you know, the idea of contributing to pension funds is something that was thought to be a hobby that you would indulge uh, in your spare time. And uh, we're going to pay the price. And as you said, there was a lawsuit filed, and you can't enforce a funding obligation on that city. Uh, so we're left holding an empty bag, uh, which is a real problem. So we have that fight ahead of us in the city, unfortunately, and we'll see. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of the current mayor. That's not really the point. Um, he's dealt a really bad hand on the pensions. We got to figure out how to, how to protect our members and, and the retirees, and it's difficult, uh, especially in the city where employees and retirees were not in Social Security. In the state, and I should have said it, many state employees are in Social Security, uh, teachers are not. Uh, so when we talk about reducing COLAs, that's all they really have is that kind of guarantee uh, going forward to protect their uh, against inflation. They don't have that Social Security benefit. Steve, thank you so much. Thank you, Hank. Good to be here.